And let's turn over to Genesis 39. In our study this quarter of bad people, good lessons from bad guys, bad people. We're going to be talking about a bad gal this, this time. And uh, so let's look at, let's start reading in verse, 30, uh, verse 1 of chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him from, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he had, how he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. He made him overseer over his house, and all that he owned, he put in his charge. Uh, that he owned, he put in his charge. And it came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. And so he left everything in, he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me, Except you, and because you are his wife, how then could I do this great evil and sin against God? And it came about as she spoke to Joseph day after day that he did not listen to her to lie behind beside her or to be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household was there inside. She caught him by his garment and said, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and he fled outside, she called to the men of their household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I screamed. And it came about when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed that he left his garment beside me and fled, and he went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his, ma until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words, and the Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came, to, came into me to make sport of me. And it happened as I raised my voice and screamed that he left his garment beside me and fled outside. And then the rest of the story is where Joseph is imprisoned. Okay. And so when we look at chapter 39, it's a lot of times, you know, here's Joseph in Egypt. And when we go in there and kind of look at this story, boom, how did he get there? Okay. How did he get there? Where do we find the story about Joseph getting into Egypt? Okay, first of all, who is Joseph? Yeah, he's Jacob's son, number 11. And, right, where do we find that? Sold into slavery. What chapter of, the, of Genesis? And if it's 39, don't you think right before 39, it's where we have to go back how far? have to go back to 37, don't you, to find out the story of Joseph, okay? Um, so it was in 30, chapter 37 that he was sold into slavery, okay? And w w Joseph is a, one, one of my favorite stories of all time is the story of Joseph, okay? And so here's Joseph sold into slavery, and the reason it's, it's just inspiring to read the story of Joseph is because of statements that he made and his, and he was alone by himself in in a foreign country not accountable to anyone but he made himself accountable to God okay and so uh, but I love I love his statement what he said in verse in verse 9 there is no one greater in this house than I 
And he, Potiphar, has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Okay? It was not sinning against the Potiphar that he was worried about. He was about worried about sinning against God or concerned with that. And that's why the Lord kept blessing But is uh, So if we have to go back, and we talk about you know, we're, the main theme of this lesson today is about the bad gal Potiphar's wife. Mrs. Potiphar. What's her name? I don't know. Potiphar's wife. You know, all the people that we've, all the people that we, in this whole series, we kind of picked out certain people, and they had a name. Okay? Why do we not know anything about Potiphar's wife other than this right here? Okay? Um, and, uh, and so it's about Potiphar. You know, we don't even know her name. Didn't know anything about her until 39, and then after this story is over, we don't know anything else about her. There is, there's some, it's really kind of funny, you know, when you look up, I do, I still do my internet search once in a while to kind of go and look at things, and and uh, it's, it's funny to me how so many authors out there have these, well, this, assume this and assume that, okay? In fact, there's some Jewish literature that, furthers the story of Potiphar's wife. They even give her a name. But still, even that is assumption. Okay, There's not anything about that. Well, I think that there's a reason. There's a reason why we don't know that. And it's withheld from us because of why? Because God just says, that's not the point. That's not, we don't need to know about Potiphar's wife. We're talking about Joseph here. Okay? The obstacles he faced, you know, and you can you can you can bring out a, a lot of stories about Joseph's life, okay? But let's look at it. What he was un, you know, he was a he was a dreamer. He interpreted dreams, and that made you know God was with him, and that turned people against him. People were jealous of him, even his own brothers that threw him in a pit. They wanted to kill him, but they threw him in a pit, and then they sold him into slavery, okay? And and then, after that, it seems like God comes in and says, "Main, you know, here's Joseph going into this, going into, uh, going into slavery. Slavery. And then, chapter thirty-eight. It's kind of like a story, like meanwhile, back at the ranch. Okay, here's the story of Judah and Tamar. Now, without even thinking, what do we know about Judah? One of the brothers." He's a, well, Reuben did actually, but Judah, Judah does have, Judah does have a, I think that, that was, at this time that was Reuben, but Judah still has an extended story, and I want to give it, what? Yeah, but where does Jesus' line come from? Judah, okay, Judah, I mean, I think there's a point here why God you know, Moses is writing these stories and he's inspired, but there's a reason. You don't just look at this and say, oh, by chapter by chapter, because we had these chapter and verses later in the Bible. Right now, this is a story that Moses is writing. And so why does he, here's the story of Joseph and we build up this climb, you know, build it up. And here's, a, you know, it's kind of like, okay, meanwhile over here. You know, have you ever seen those sitcoms where there's like two or maybe even three stories going on in the same time? They go here. And then they go over here. That's it's almost like what this is. So why would Judah and Tamar story be in the middle? Just real quick, we don't want to study about Judah and Tamar, but what happened is Tamar's uh, husband, the first son of Judah, died. And so Judah said Tamar take or, or t told his brothers to take Tamar, and they are evil. Er, er, God killed Er, I think his name, E-R, killed him. And one brother after another died until finally Judah said, I'm tired of having my sons die, so you go off for a while. And he didn't intend to, to treat her well at all. And then she tricked him. She became pregnant with uh, from Judah, 
she tricked him. Like I said, this is another story. I don't want to get into that. But the thing about the Judah and Tamar story is in the in Jesus' line is Judah, but there is a an, an immoral situation, an immoral union, and a birth that is in Jesus' line. Okay? And it's mentioned that in the genealogy. So why is that stuck in here? Well, if you go back, and I've heard a lot of, I've read a lot, and I've heard a lot about how you can compare Joseph's, Joseph's life to possibly Jesus' life. You know, what happens? Even uh, he was sold into Egypt for 20 pieces of silver. And someone, I mentioned I was in a class one time, and they said, well, you can't compare that to Jesus. He was betrayed with 30 pieces of silver. He goes, after that many years, that's inflation. Okay? <laughs> and so, so you, you, people have, and I think it's probably a good line of looking at Joseph's life and, and, and seeing the life of Jesus. And that's what the Old Testament does. If you go back and look at every single story, you know, even from the, even from the creation, every single story points to Jesus. Everyone. And this is one of them. And to have Judah and Tamar stuck right in the middle of this is not an accident. Okay? To me, it's kind of like saying, okay, Joseph is going into unknown territory. Joseph's going to be by himself in a pagan society, in a pagan world. And I don't know God has been testing him, but God has also been uh, faithful to him. He's blessed him. Exactly, exactly. And we'll see what the final results are here. Um, Talking about Judah, though, and then I'll kind of get off of him. If you go over to Genesis 44, 18. Let's, let's turn over there. And we'll just briefly, uh, before you start reading or look at it, this is a story where Joseph, has his brothers have come to to get some grain to get, you know, so they can. But in verse 18, well, what basically what is Joseph says, I'm going to keep as a hostage. One of your sons, I'll keep Joseph, Benjamin. So who pleads for Benjamin's life? Look at that. Verse 18. Then Judah approached him and said, O oh my Lord, may your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ear. and Do not be angry with me. So that discourse right after that is Judah. And I like to think that Judah learned his lesson. Okay? Through all the things that events that occurred. So this is over the last... Over the next, uh, was it 13? I, I, I got to put the numbers together. At least, at least 13, maybe 15 years uh, of, of, of time has passed since they seen Joseph. And I want to say, I want to think by just looking at this that Judah learned his lesson. Okay, but that's that's where that's the story of Judah. And like I said, we don't want to go there on that on this way. But let's go back now. Uh, to the story of Joseph. And this Potiphar's wife that we don't know, why is it, first of all, why do you think that we care about what her name was, what happened to her, what what became, what? why do? Why does that bother us so much? It does, may not bother you, and it doesn't really bother me once I start thinking about it and reading about it and praying about it. But why does it bother people? Why do we have books after books and commentaries on Potiphar's wife? If God didn't want us to know about Potiphar, he would, you know, if he wanted us to know, he would have told us. You're missing the point. Yeah. Yeah. We need to pass them down too, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, the I take some comfort from not knowing Potiphar's wife's name, but isn't there a part of us, human nature, we want 
We want the bad people punished. God punished that bad person. I don't, exactly. We don't know anything about Potiphar. They're, they're characters in Joseph's story. Don't take... Do what? Yeah. Yeah. It's a part of Joseph's story. And we get off the point wondering about, well, in fact, one of the Jewish... Like I said, I... I, I have fun searching the internet and just kind of going in and kind of see what different people say. And there's this one commentator that said, well, the Jewish writings say this, and she turned good because she realized what she had done wrong. And, and but, you know, she turned uh, turned over a leaf. We're kind of sitting there going. And then they say, well, this is just assumption or this is just. It's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly, but that's what we do. We want justice done and, and say that God, you know, aren't we stepping in God's shoes when we say punish that person? And we get off the point so easy. And it's so easy for us to do that. You know, we love to kind of imagine those things. So, so, but basically, I really like the idea, though, of not knowing anything about Potiphar or Potiphar's wife. Why? Because we know evil's in the world. And we don't always know what evil's name. We just know what our responsibilities are. We know we shouldn't sin against God. And, and we know what we, we need to hold each other accountable. But we don't always know what Mack truck hits us on, on, on our path. We get hit and runs all the time in our lives. And we don't know these things. But it doesn't matter because we know God is with us. And that's the story of Joseph. God was with him throughout. And so uh, one of the conjectures of uh, one of the one of the assumptions is she did what she did because she was idle. And if you want to and, that, and that's not a bad, bad story. That's not a bad way of looking at it, you know, because from every Bible story you read throughout the Bible, you can take a lot of lessons from it, especially Joseph's life. You can go back and get a lot of lessons. So to kind of go off and say, okay, she was idle. You know, she didn't have any much to do. She had everything at her fingertips. And here's this pool boy, Joseph, you know, that was handsome and, and built. And she wanted to have relations with him. And, and you know, that's a story within itself. But, but, but she had nothing else to do, okay? And like I said, if you want to get into... Don't be idle. You can bring in certain uh, scripture throughout the Bible about how idleness is the devil's workshop and how you should not be do doing that. Uh, so, and so anyway, you can get off on that, but all of that about that that story is just conjecture and guessing. You know, be be aware that we need to get back to the story of uh, of Joseph. So let's read on to uh, in Joseph's story. So any comments up to this point? Anybody want to say anything? You know, you know, you know. I noticed about you, Wendy. Says you, you must somehow get in and read my notes before I. <laughs> this is at least. <laughs> this is about the second or third time that you've done that in this series. I think that uh, that's great. That's great. That, that I love that. No, honestly, you're right. Um, let's look over. We, you know, the thing about Joseph's story is. If you're reading this the first time through, you know, it's, it's, it's a great story. You know, God is with Joseph. And what happened, okay, let's go back and, uh, about Joseph being in prison. What did he do wrong? Okay, when his brothers, uh, I used to say this, and I will apologize and I ask for forgiveness. But for a long time, I used to think that Joseph, because Joseph, uh, in fact, when I lived in Albuquerque, went to a church 
And one of the elders there that I just thoroughly, I think he's, I think he's the preacher now down in Cloudcroft. If he's still there, either that or he's, uh, and he has to be an elderly if he's still alive, very elderly elder there. But um, he loved the story of Joseph as well. And he did a whole quarter series on Joseph. And I was just enamored by by his by his teaching and also by uh, the story of Joseph. But uh, I always thought, well, here's a 17-year-old boy with a coat of many colors, and he was telling everybody his dreams. And how many 17-year-old boys do you know that's not cocky? Okay. Uh, <laughs> but no, honestly, I used to say that, and then I thought, and that's not fair. It doesn't say that in there. He just got, he was, he was being who he was and how God led him. And so, but because of that, and I think this, I've came to realize that if you do what God wants you to do, the world is jealous. The world doesn't like you being blessed because you're, a, you're you know, you've got some, you got some principle. You've got God as your, as your Lord. And the world is jealous. And they do what? They rip off your coat. Okay, lie to your, lie to your peers, you know, lie to your parents, and then, you know, and that this person has done, uh, is is gone, and they sell you into slavery, and you know they do bad things to you because you're God's servant, and sometimes you don't even know who did it. So, um, and then, but but you're right, God is always with us. So let's go back to verse 19, and uh, again, he's in Egypt. No one else, no one would have blamed Joseph if he just said, God has forsaken me. I'm over here all by myself. I am, uh, you know, I'm doomed. I might as well just do what, you know, if I'm in Egypt, do as Egypt's, Egyptians do, you know. Um, but he didn't. And basically, I, I, I really believe we read about the people in the in the Bible. We read about the Abrahams and the Jacobs and the, I mean, the eyes, and the, we read about people like Joseph because they were faithful. And that's why we read about them. And so now in verse 19, it came about when his master heard the words of his wife, which he, she spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me, that his anger burned, that his anger burned. And so Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in jail. Now, did he deserve to be in jail? Of course not. Okay, now there's been some, also some uh, discussion uh, that I read that when he heard he was, he was, uh, he was uh, angry. Well, who was he angry at? Was he angry at Joseph or did he know who his wife was? Was he angry with her? Okay, again, let's don't get into guessing. The fact is he, he was angry. He put Joseph in jail when he probably could have been executed. So some people say, well, he put him in jail to protect him. That's not even, that's even a guess. The fact is, Joseph was in jail for what wrongdoing? Nothing. Do we ever get in jail when we do what God wants us to do? I mean, you know the people in Rome did during, during, the, during Paul's time. In what way? Like, I mean, I really... What I like to do, Wendy, honestly, I like to bring that on today's. Let's look at it today. So elaborate what you mean. Yeah, it's it's hard not to, I know. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think the story of Joseph, to, ta to piggyback on what you're saying, I think the story of Joseph is critical for us to read today in our environment, in our, in our society. And look for people that, you know, it may be us, but look for people that you may say, this guy's a moral guy, let's follow him, you know? And so, um, and there's, there's probably a lot of examples, but uh, one of my favorite guys, I won't say his name, you may know who it is by when I say it, but one of, his, one of our, one of my favorite guys recently, not a month ago or so, but recently made a mistake. But, well, you know who it is, Ted Cruz, one of my, one of my favorite guys, he made a mistake probably leaving Texas when he shouldn't have, but he realized what he did and he came back. The difference between what he's done and what other people have done when they get caught at something mistake, he owned up to it. He said, I made a mistake, I came back. Okay? Whereas others tried to shift the blame to everybody else, both on both sides of the aisle, you know? And so, uh, so I've got to go off on a tangent. I want to talk back to Joseph, though. Let's go back. Let's go on and read that. So how many years did he stay in prison, in jail? Two years, I think it was two years. That, uh, let me see, was it two? Huh? At a minimum, two. Okay. And if you go back and look at the details of Joseph's life to Jesus' life, you know you can pick you can get, pick out little things like this. Okay. Um, but but um, oh. I, I get emotional sometimes when I think about things like that, you know. Even in jail, God favored him, and the jailer loved him, and the jailer, you know. And people say, oh, he gets all the, God likes him because he's good looking and, and, you know, handsome and built. You know, he's a, he's a man man, you know. But no, everybody, everybody liked him, okay. And um, let's read on down to verse 22. Uh, well, no, let's go back to 21. The Lord was was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. So in other words, Joseph wasn't trying to escape. Okay? And um, he was doing whatever. He was working and doing God's will wherever he was. That is a lesson to us as well. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made prosper. Do you remember back when Potiphar saw how well he did? What did Potiphar said? Let's go back there and look. Uh, verse 3. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper. Potiphar, who was not a Jew, you know, probably paid homage to the pagan gods. Okay gave the Lord credit for prospering Joseph. And I would assume, it doesn't say that, but I would assume the jailer did too. So your actions speak louder than a lot of times than words. Your actions will preach. And that's what Joseph was doing here as well. So let's go on. Now we know about the dreams now that come up. Okay? What happens? We got just about five, seven minutes before class is over. Let's do a quick synopsis of what happens after this. Verse 40, if y'all have little subtitles in your, in your Bible, mine says on, ba on page 55, Joseph interprets dream, a dream. What was the dream? The vines and the cows. And basically the interpretation was seven years of, of plenty. Seven years of abundance. Seven years of good life. Okay? And then right after that, seven years of famine. And, uh, and Pharaoh saw what was, uh, Pharaoh saw that, you know, he interpreted the dream with confidence, I'm sure. You know, anybody comes in and says, oh, my dreams, well, I think this is what it is. Uh-uh. You know, he interpreted dreams. Now, when's the last time he interpreted dreams? Did he interpret dreams from the time he was in Potter's house all the way, you know, he interpreted dreams to the the, the guys, guys that were in jail with him, the well, the cupbearer and the baker? Huh? Yeah. 
So we hadn't heard much about his dreams until about this part forward. Okay. He was dreaming at 17, we, but I, I assume he was still dreaming. And we, we don't know of all the dreams he interpreted. Again, God gets, even if he did, if he did or didn't, we don't know. That, that's not part of it. But he interpreted this dream, and it put him in a, a role of authority. And who did he save? God was with him and saved him. What else happened? Who else did God save? A nation of what? Of pagans? Is God saved pagans? Why? Why did he save the country of Egypt? The nation of Egypt. They, when God's blessings are on someone, you know, they're in, what is it? Psalms 23 says, my cup overflows. When, when God's people are blessed, it's just a natural overflowing to other people. And if you're in that overflow, you're getting blessed as well. Okay? And I really feel like when we have, we have moral Christian people in charge of of our cities and our you know things. You know we know evil is going to be out there. That it, it'll never go away. It's been there ever since uh, sin inter- was introduced into the world, and it's still there and will continue. So we need to be aware of that. But Christians in charge just have a natural overflowing, and people are blessed. People are blessed, and uh, and I really look at Lubbock, Texas, as being one of the most conservative Christian. You know we're not perfect by no means. By no means. But I think we have a lot of Christian people in this town, and it just seems to overflow, you know, to other people that that may not be Christians. But it's still, look at what happened. God's, in Joseph's life, Job stayed, Joseph stayed faithful. He couldn't sin against God. He kept stayed faithful, and he not only saved himself and, not his, and his family eventually, he saved the nation of Egypt and surrounding nations. Because of his ability. And, you know, you talk about 13 years. He was in charge of Potiphar. You know, at 17 years old, did he know all there? Could he have run, did what he did at 30 years old or 35, however old he was? Could he have done that? I think it was 37 when his brothers, I think it was 20 years later when his brothers came down. I think about it. Could he have done that at 17? Maybe not. Probably not. Now, could God, boom, you're you're going to be in charge. Sure he could, but he doesn't work that way. He trained him in tough places, and Joseph was faithful. And so now he's, if you're faithful in little, God puts you faithful in much. You know, he'll put you in charge of a lot. And he put him in the charge of saving a nation. And it's because I'm under Joseph's charge. Now look at that and bring that to Jesus, okay? I was asked by, in a class, I was asked by a minister one time, if you had the ability if you had the, the power to save the life of the, of the greatest man that ever lived, would you do it? If you would, then you condemn mankind. Because it was God's plan for God, Jesus to go to the cross. And because of that death, because of that death, mankind has been saved. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I think about, and that brings us back to Judah and Tamar. When is I don't know when Moses wrote this. Okay. I'm not sure, but he's going back and telling the story that's probably been handed down by, by word, you know, from generation to generation. And he's going back. And so he's going back and saying, you know, and God has a hand in this as well. In Joseph's story, Judah and Tamar, my promise is still there. My promise will be fulfilled. And it looks and points toward Jesus. Okay. All right. That is my, any comments? We've got about two minutes left. Yes, sir.
And I think, and also, I, the only other thing I get really inspired about is when we talk about Potiphar's wife and and the the insertion the insertion of Judah and Tamar's story, it, you know, nothing's done by accident. And so many times, I get excited about the unknown. We 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 serve an invisible God. You know, we didn't see it by human eyes, but we see the results of His work. By far, I see the results of His work among you guys. Okay. And it gets us to the point where we get excited about the unknown because we know of what he's done for us. We know what he's, you know, and it's, it's something that humankind has battled. First of all, I was reading this morning again uh, in my daily Bible to talk about the, how the Egyptians, you know, not the Egyptians, the, uh, the Israelites made that golden calf because they gave up, you know, and, uh, and so they, they forgot, and, and but anyway, it's a it's a great story, and uh, I'm inspired to go back and read. And that's the thing that uh, for the rest of Genesis through 50, it's all about Joseph. And, and uh, so, anyway, any other comments? All right, thank you, guys.